Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Someone say, he is good. good. Go ahead and grab your seats if you would. We're talking about hope lives. And we believe that not, whoo, someone's with me already. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. I love it. Glory to God. And uh, one thing, we're just going to look at a couple things this morning. Hallelujah. And I believe it's going to help all of us. Glory to God. But one thing that I know for sure is the devil doesn't like you being happy. So he'll send all sorts of things to try to get you away from Jesus. Because the devil knows this, that if you have Jesus, you have hope. Because the Bible says that he is the source of hope. And so the devil wants to separate you from all things Christ. He wants to separate you from the word. This is what he said over in John 10, 10, right? That the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. You recognize that. You see what he said. He said, steal, kill, and destroy. Before the devil can kill and destroy your life, he's got to steal something from you. And he wants to steal your faith. He wants to steal the word of God from you. Because if he can separate you from your faith, then all hope is lost. Because he's separated from the source of hope. And so this morning, we've got to determine in our hearts that nothing's going to separate us. Just like it says over there in the book of Romans, no demon can separate us, no sin can separate us, nothing on heaven or on earth can separate us because nothing separates us from the love of God. Hallelujah. Nothing can separate you if you refuse to be separated. And so what we're going to look at first is that we've got to decide to fight. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. fighter. No, say it loud. Say, I'm a fighter. I believe that you are, hallelujah. Well, why do we got to fight? Because if we have faith, we have everything that we need. So we got to fight to stay joined to this faith. Glory to God, over in Romans 4, reading out New Living Translation, verse 16, Pastor Belinda hit on it. It says, so that's why faith is the key. God's promise is given to us as a free gift. You've been given a promise. Amen. And the way you access that promise is through faith. That's why the Apostle Paul is saying here in Romans, faith is the key. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. I love this. Faith is the key because the promise is being given a free gift. And if we are certain, we are certain to receive it, whether or not we follow Jewish customs or if we have faith. But if we have faith like Abraham, listen, if you've got faith like Abraham, you can receive the promise. Amen. And so we've got to fight the good fight of faith. We can't let anybody separate us from this faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Don't let any trial, tribulation, persecution, thoughts, anything separate you from this first timothy 6 11 through 12 it says but you man of god flee from all of this and pursue righteousness godliness faith love endurance and gentleness fight the good fight of faith take hold of eternal life which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses elcott's commentary about the scripture says the good fight more closely considered is the contest and struggle which the christians have to maintain against the world the flesh and the devil I'm going to try to slow down and read that one more time so we can grab it. Hallelujah. The good fight more closely considered is the contest and struggle which the Christians have to maintain against the world, the flesh, and the devil. See, we've got these three things that are constantly trying to steal our faith. And the reason why they're trying to steal our faith is because the devil knows. Hallelujah. If he can separate you from your faith, he's got you. If he can steal hope from you, what is hope? It's a confident expectation. Amen. If he can steal hope from you, then he's got you. So we have to fight and say, we will not be moved from this. I'm not going to let the world move me. I'm not going to let my flesh move me. How many of you know there's a lot of people that didn't come to church this morning because their flesh wanted to sleep in? See, we can't let anything move us. We can't let the devil move us. We can't let our flesh move us. We can't let this world move us away from Jesus. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. First Corinthians 15, 50 say, I feel like... No, I'm not going to sing Beyonce. Hallelujah. <laughs> I must have that. Oh, what, all right. Maybe I will sing it. Hallelujah. No, no. First Corinthians. I have no. Oh, well, all right. Keep going. Praise the Lord. Sure. Not going to dance like her up here on the stage. <laughs> yeah. You knew I was going to say it. I couldn't let it go. All right. Anyways. How, First Corinthians 15, 57 and 58. But you got to be a fighter, man. Listen, I, I'm so tired of the devil running amok in the church. Because every time the church comes up against some adversity, they just lay down. Pastor alluded to it last week. He said, we got to stop laying down. We got to decide that we're going to fight because if we fight, we win every time. The only reason you lose is because you give up. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. (laughs) Now say, I'm a survivor. (laughs) Hallelujah. All right, I'll move on. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 through 58. It says, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone say, say it again. 
Hallelujah. Y'all seen The Lion King? <laughs> you know, when the, the hyenas are in the cave and they're like, Mufasa. <laughs> and every time one of them says Mufasa, the other one's like, ooh. You know what I mean? And then when they do that, they're like, ooh. And when they do that, they're like, say it again. Hallelujah. That's the way I get when I read this scripture. I'm like, say it again. Ooh. You know what I mean? Why? Because Jesus lives inside of me. Hallelujah. You know, I had this science teacher and uh, he got fired because he was a little outside the box. But we used to do this thing in seventh grade. He had this uh, little taser and uh, we would grab onto these little metal faucets in the science room. And one person would grab the faucet and then we would all join hands and he would tase the faucet and that electric current would come down every single one of us. And what we would do is we'd stand out in the hallway and touch people as they walked by. All of us were willing to pay the price to zap some sixth grader, you know? And so we'd be like, oh, that hurts, get him! You know, and we just tag him, hallelujah. Uh, that's the way I feel when I got Jesus. I got some voltage running through me. I got something to be excited about. I got something to be hopeful about. I got something because I got Jesus. Nah, y'all ain't feeling it, hallelujah. I got Jesus! And since I got him, I got hope. Hallelujah. I love this. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Say it again. Hallelujah. All right. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hallelujah. Listen to the next part. Let nothing move you. Let nothing move you. You got to hold firm to your faith that you professed among many witnesses. You got to stand firm and you got to hold on to this and don't let the devil steal your faith and your relationship with Jesus because when you have that relationship, you have hope. Amen. Everybody say, I'm a, I'm a fighter. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Romans 15, 13 says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you'll overflow with what? With confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, what I've come to realize is lots of times when we don't have hope, it's because we've separated ourselves from God. I was listening to uh, 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 John Gray, one of the pastors I follow, and he was talking about how, you know, ladies... Before they give birth to something, they have to have a moment of intimacy with someone. And that moment of intimacy gives way to something, and then they give birth to something. And then he's saying, there's a whole lot of the church trying to give birth to something, but they don't have any intimacy. Listen, if you want to give birth to hope, you got to be intimate with the source of hope. Amen. If you want hope to give its work in your life, then you've got to be intimate to the one that produces this hope inside of you, the King of glory. Amen. And so we've got to stand firm and we've got to stay connected with him and we've got to be intimate with him. And when we do, something is conceived in us. It's hope. A faithful, joyful expectation. And that expectation set things in motion where you can receive the promises. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. Now say, I'm a survivor. Woo, praise Jesus. I love it when the Apostle Paul was on the boat and that storm was crashing against it and all the Roman and the Satyrians were like, we're going to die. The Apostle Paul went and had his intimate moment with God. And in that moment, of it, in that moment of intimacy, God burst some hope in him. And he said, be of good cheer. How many of us, you know, we let the storm depress us. We let what the, it's amazing how we elevate what the devil's doing. And then all of a sudden, it steals this hope from us. The Apostle Paul refused to elevate the storm above his God. And so he went into the belly, hallelujah, and he spent some intimate time with God. And hope was instilled with him. And God said to him, not all will be lost. You will leave with your lives. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. God is more powerful than anything you're facing. Yes, he is. And as long as you got him, you got everything you need. Amen. Amen. I like to use this illustration of a hose. I didn't bring one in here today because if I spray water in here, pastor will just, hallelujah. <laughs> but if I came in here with a hose, and as long as that hose is connected to the faucet, it's got a supply of water running through it. And that faucet never runs out of supply. Amen. When you're connected to him, you always have hope. 
And that hope will always flow through you. But you have to decide that you will stay connected. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, now the contemporary English version, it says we often suffer, but we're never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. Say, I'll never give up. Say it again. Say, I'll never give up. No matter what your flesh is saying. No matter what the world is saying. No matter what the devil is saying. Make up your mind, I'm never going to give up. I will see the faithfulness of God in the land of the living. I will never give up. I'm going to dig in my heels and I'm going to stand with the promises of God and the word of God because it is true, it is tried, it is tested, and he is faithful. Someone say, I'm a fighter. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 19. Timothy, my son, I give you this command, keeping it with the prophecies once made about you. So by the recalling of them, you may fight the battle well. How's he going to fight the battle well? Holding on to faith in good conscience, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked with regard to their faith. you got to fight well, and the way you fight well is by holding on to your faith. Amen. Amen. And as we fight well, listen to this, I believe this. Paul knew that if Timothy had his faith, he would have hope. And that hope, a confident expectation in the source of hope, would pull him through any storm. See, I don't believe there's a storm you can face that God won't pull you through. That's right, that's right. I don't believe there's a trial the devil can send you away that God's not bigger and better than. I believe he'll pull you through every single time if you'll hold on to your faith and if you'll hold on to hope. Amen. Now, Timothy, we have to understand what's going on because we read all these scriptures and we're like, yeah, Timothy, just hold on. Fight the faith, man. You got this. But how challenging was it for Timothy to fight this faith? Well, I'm not a huge history buff. I'm reading a book right now called Life in the Combat Zone, and I believe it's a good book for you to read because we all live in the combat zone. We know that the devil's the God of this world. And as long as the devil's the God of this world, we're going to face some things. Amen. But we're not going to let those things beat us. And so this book goes into great detail about what Timothy was facing. And I learned some stuff when I was reading it. There was this king and his name was Nero. And he wanted to clear a way in the city for his new palace. He was a little bit of a narcissist and he liked to glorify himself. So he wanted to build a new palace and a statue that looked like him. And he just wanted to be like, hey, you know, that's me. And so to make way for his palace, he burned the city down. It's called the Great Fire of Rome. You can go read about it. And when he burned the city down, historians and history tells us that the public begin to turn against him. Well, don't you know when you start burning people's houses, <laughs> they're going to get mad. You know, I don't know how he didn't have that. That's what narcissism does. It doesn't give you any foresight. You know what I mean? He was so focused on self, he couldn't see the repercussions. And so when the public opinion started turning against him, he said, man, I got to do something. I can't have all these people mad with me. And so he created this scapegoat, which was easy to do. And he began to blame the church. And one of the churches there was Timothy's church, the church of Ephesus. It was a growing, thriving church. I mean, it was a good church. They were rocking and reeling. The move of the spirit, hallelujah. They had a worship team like Ted. And I mean, they were just rocking it. And they were feeling it, man. It was really good. And then all of a sudden, Nero blames them for this fire. And the public turns against them. Now the church begins to suffer some of the greatest persecution they'd ever seen before that. And so people that were going to Timothy's church here at Ephesus, he had 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people at his church. All of a sudden, one by one, they stopped coming on Sundays. I don't know if they do church like us, Wednesday nights, Sundays, Saturdays, whatever. No, they just stopped coming. And so imagine this. The king has turned against him. The public has turned against him. And now his own church is turning against him. It looks like a very hopeless situation. Apostle Paul since he was one of Timothy's mentors, he knew that Timothy might be feeling a little bit discouraged. So that's why he wrote them, him these letters. And he said, fight the good fight of faith. Don't let this king, don't let the community, don't let the church separate you from Jesus. See, listen, guys, everything doesn't always go our way. Even in church. See, because this building right here, you know, when I'm talking about the church, you are the church. And God's church is made up of a bunch of imperfect people. Maybe not you, hallelujah. Y'all perfect and so beautiful in every way. Liars. <laughs> Got him. I mean, come on. You ain't perfect. We all working on stuff. Amen. We are Christians in progress. Glory to God. Now, I don't say that so you can leave this place and be like, Robert said I can do whatever I want. I'm not perfect. No, you got to try. Hallelujah. Cody has a saying we say teenagers all the time, at least try. <laughs> In your faith, at least try. Amen. But we understand that this place isn't made up of perfect people. And this world surely not made up of perfect people. And though, so there's a lot of things that happen that are discouraging to our faith. And lots of times people let those discouraging things that happen move them away from Jesus. Everybody say, I'm a fighter. 
Hope is a confident, joyful expectation. We have to keep a confident, joyful expectation no matter what's going on. Hope in us. Colossians 2, 6 through 7, our study Bible says, Therefore, just as you receive Christ Jesus your Lord, continue to live in him, rooted, built up in him, established in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. 1 Corinthians 1, 8. He will sustain you till the end. Man, that's good news. I don't have to sustain myself. Because guess what? There's an end to my ability and an end to my power. Just like there's an end to your ability and your power. But if you'll stay connected to him, the one who has no end, woo, whose power is limitless, he will sustain you. How through all the ups and downs of this world, God will sustain you. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. Colossians 1, 22 through 23. But now be reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. If you continue, everyone say continue. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to you, every creature under heaven, and which I, Paul, have become a servant. We've got to gravitate and hold on to this hope we have in Jesus. Amen. Don't let anything separate us. John 15 talks about he is the vine, we are the branches. Anyone who abides in him and he in them, they can do all things and all things will be possible unto them. Amen. Glory to God. You can do it. <laughs> I said you can do it. Amen. And God's trying to, if Timothy can do it, you can do it. Amen. And we got to stick to him the same way Timothy did. 2 Timothy 2.1. Timothy, my dear, strong, be, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God has given you. Listen to me. No matter what you're facing, remember that you have a grace. And that grace is not only sufficient for you, but it is more powerful than the trial that you are facing. So the first thing we have to do is we have to decide, I'm not giving up on Jesus. Because Jesus never gave up on me. And all, as long as I have him, the source of hope, then I have hope. And it doesn't matter how bad it gets, my God's going to pull me through. Doesn't matter what the storm feels like, doesn't matter what the storm looks like, God's got me. Amen. So we fight to stay connected to him. Everyone say, I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter. The next thing we got to do is see this is we got to be joyful. Pastor Mark, he talked about this last week. Go listen to the podcast. Here's a few scriptures for you. Romans 15, 13. We're not going to read them. Romans 12, 12. How, well, maybe not. Nah, we won't. Glory to God. Romans 5, 2. And then Nehemiah 8, 10. Nehemiah 8, 10. We'll read that one. It says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Let God's joy, whether you realize the story of Nehemiah, he had a bunch of people that were trying to kill him while he was re rebuilding that wall. How did he stay strong in that trial? How did he stay strong in that condemnation? How did he stay strong in that? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, yeah. Just like Pastor Balloon was talking about, Charles Caps, when stuff's not going your way, laugh at it. Uh -huh. The Bible says, he who sits in the heavens does what? He laughs. <laughs> Glory. I'm not going to let this stuff get me down. Come on now, I'm just not, I, make up your mind. Uh, I follow DeMarcus Ware on Instagram and he posted something the other day. And one thing he posted, he said, joy is a decision. Choose to be happy. I remember, uh, you know, you, some of you have heard me share this story, but I remember when Christian, my youngest boy, was born his first few days of his life. He had some breathing issues, and so he spent some time in the NICU, uh, the, the child's intensive care unit down there in Huntsville, and uh, everything was fine, and, and he came out, and he's just wild and crazy, and, and we love him. But several months after that happened, I received a letter in the mail, and I was standing out at my mailbox, and I, I opened up my mailbox, and I pulled it out, and it said Huntsville Hospital on it. And I'm so ignorant and naive. I was just like, oh, the hospital sent me a letter to thank me for our visit. They want me to know that everything's all right and, and glory to God. And so I was excited and I opened it up. It was not a thank you letter. That NICU is expensive. And they wanted to get paid. And so I looked at that. And I made a decision right there in my mailbox. This is a true story. Neighbors and everybody out of their mailboxes. And I just held it up to God and started rejoicing. Y'all, you don't know the number that was on there, but I couldn't pay it even if I wanted to. <laughs> Selling both kidneys, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> so what do you do when it's not going to happen? What do you do when, when, you're, when there's nothing you can do? Hallelujah. You'd just as well be happy about it. <laughs> Glory to God. You'd just as well have joy. You'd just as well laugh and say, Ha ha, devil, you can't win. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. I thank you, Lord. You take care of this. And I had hope. A joyful expectation. My expectation was so great, I didn't even tell Rachel about it. I didn't want to bum her out. Hallelujah. And so I was like, I got this, you know. I think it was like maybe one week, it might have been the next time we were at church, somebody walked up to me, gave me an envelope. 
We went home that day. We opened up that envelope. It was the exact, I think it was a few pennies over the amount that we needed to pay the hospital. We have hope. Now, if I could tell my wife, who she's so wonderful, you know, when we opened up the letter, she didn't know nothing about the hospital bill. So when we opened it up and there was money, she just, <laughs> woo, shop it. No, I, don't, I don't know what she was thinking. And then, you know, in the middle of her rejoicing, I was like, oh, yeah, baby, we got this bill. <laughs> but you can have a couple pennies. Hallelujah. You know, it's a little extra. You know, God didn't forget about you. Hallelujah. I love you, doll. Hey, all right. Hallelujah. <laughs> It wasn't her fault. It was my fault. I didn't tell her about it. And she's like, what you say? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sorry. Here it is. The hospital wrote this letter to you. Glory to God. <laughs> so we got to be joyful. Be joyful. No matter what the weapon is. I love that song. Hallelujah. I almost had y'all sing. No matter what the weapon is, I win. Man, I love that song. Not just because Ted does this. Ah! You know, I love that song because of the message. No matter what the weapon is. I win. And then it goes in, we win, we win, you know what I mean? No matter what the weapon is, we win. Amen? Everyone say, I got joy. I got joy. Hallelujah. In the last few minutes we're together, I really want to look at this. The next thing, if you're going to have hope, you got to control what you meditate on. You got to control what you think on. Hallelujah. A science study on quantum physics is uncovering. Now listen to this. This is a study that I was reading. Uh, you know, science isn't my thing. Other than that one science teacher I had, I just didn't get science. Glory to God. But there's this scientific study on quantum physics. And listen what this, science is, this, this study is discovering. It's uncovering that one's perception and beliefs about reality actually alter reality to fit that perspective. Let me read it again. A study on quantum physics is uncovering that one's perceptions and beliefs about reality actually alter reality to fit that perspective. So what you believe about your reality is going to alter your reality to fit that perspective. So what does that mean? If you believe that you're broke, your reality is going to be altered to fit that perspective. If you believe that you are sick and you meditate on it day and night, day and night, and day and night, if you believe that science, I'm so glad science is catching up to the Bible, hallelujah, amen, but they say that if you meditate on it, that that perceptive or that perception is going to alter your reality until that becomes your perspective. Listen, what you meditate on is powerful. The rest of this study says this new understanding of our world has yet to make it to the mainstream individual. What does that mean? A lot of people don't know about this. Thus, people continue to believe that their reality is the way it is because of something beyond their control. When in fact, their reality is the way it is because of a specific way they expect it to be. If you expect your marriage to be hard and a struggle, you will have that reality. If you expect to never, if this is your expectation that every single day you're going to fight and struggle with your boss and your employer, that perspective, that belief is going to shape your reality. If you believe and you have this expectation that you're never going to do good in school, then guess what? That perspective and that belief is going to shape your reality. Amen. Let's read some scriptures to reinforce. Job is a good example of this. You remember what Job said? He said, my greatest fear has come upon me. See, he had this expectation. He had this belief in all these bad things that were going to happen to him. And that expectation and that belief in him built this reality in the world in which he lived. And then finally, he saw his expectation. He saw his belief become a reality. And then he said, my greatest fear has come upon me. I wonder... What would have happened to Job if he had spent his time glorifying and exalting the goodness and the faithfulness of God? Y'all didn't like that one that much. All right. See, and, and, and I'll just, I can relate. It's so easy to meditate the negative things. I don't know why humanity likes to do that. See, I, I used to listen to a lot of talk radio, and I used to love it when they'd be picking on a, a certain politician or a certain company or something like that. In my flesh, I'd be like, get him! I don't know why. Why do we like that? Our human nature is so petty. 
right? And, and that our, our nature loves to indulge in these things that condemn others and bring others down. That's just our human nature. But you've got a greater nature about you. You've got a greater nature where you don't have to look at these negative things anymore. But you've got to understand what you focus on becomes your reality. Proverbs, 20, or Proverbs 4, 21 through 23 says, My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your hearts, for they bring life to those who find them and heal into their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now listen to verse 23 out of the Good News Translation. I love this. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Come on now. When I was studying this, it was actually before I started studying this, the Lord began to deal with me about this, about the things I was thinking about all day long. And about the meditations of Robert and how those meditations were building beliefs in me and then those beliefs were shaping my reality. Faith is powerful, amen? amen. And so we have to be careful what we meditate on. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you think about yourself is what you are. Amen. Oh, come on now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How does he do this? By changing the way that you think. Joyce Meyer's got a book called The Battlefield of the Mind. You know most of the battles in your life happen right here. And I'll even say this. The outcome of those battles happens right here. It starts here in your mind, and if you're going to win, you got to win in here. Pastor Mark said it several months ago, you fell in here before you fell out here. Right. Amen. So you got to win in your mind, and when you win in your mind, your belief's going to line up with your right thinking. You'll be right believing, and then you'll have the right reality. Amen. What's the right reality? The promises he's given to me. And I'm not going to settle for anything else. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah, Joshua 1 8. It says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate in it there day and night, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Listen, when, when, when the Lord was ministering this to Joshua, why was he telling him to meditate in his word? Because at this moment in time, Joshua's leader, Moses, has just died. So he's lost his leader, someone who he loved dearly. And then he looks and he says, well, God gave us the promised land, but we're not in the promised land. And then he looks and he sees Jericho, and guess what's going on with Jericho? The walls are still up. And so he had to make a decision, Joshua, what am I going to ponder? What, and that's what meditate means, right? The things that you ponder. What am I going to meditate on? What am I going to rehearse in my mind? And so God's bringing us here to Joshua 1, and he's saying, Joshua, don't rehearse that Moses is gone. Don't rehearse that you're not in the promised land. Don't rehearse that the walls are still up. Rehearse me, and I'll make everything else change. So basically he's saying, don't rehearse the facts. Rehearse me, and I'll change the facts. That's a good word. Don't rehearse the facts. Rehearse me, and I will change the facts. Glory to God. So Joshua begins to rehearse all these things, and what do we know? We know that he took Jericho because God brought the walls down. Amen? He was able to lead people where Moses was not able to lead them simply because he was rehearsing the right things and meditating on what God said over what he saw. Meditation is important. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Did you know every thought that comes your way is not a thought from you, not a thought from God, and not a thought from the devil? We get thoughts from all sorts of places. Anybody in here ever had a bad thought about their spouse? <laughs> Someone's like, I'm going to shout amen so everyone hears me. <laughs> Glory to God. First service, when I said that, they all just looked at me stone cold. No one was brave enough to say anything. <laughs> Nobody wanted to get involved with that. But listen, every thought you have is not a good thought. Likewise, every thought you have is not a bad thought. But you have to choose what you're going to meditate on. And don't you know it's just as easy to meditate on the negative things as it is the positive things. And the only reason it looks like there's more negative is because that's what you're choosing to see. Yeah, y'all don't believe that one. It's true, though. Hallelujah. When you focus on the positive things, you'll realize there's a whole lot more positive things than you realized. Right. Amen. So where's our attention? What's the things that we're focused on and the things that we're thinking about? And then God begins to tell us what we're supposed to think about. Philippians 4, 7 through 9. He says, and now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, before we move on to the next verse, how many of you want the peace of God? 
Amen. I want the peace of God that transcends all understanding. The Bible says that Jesus gave me his peace. Amen. Well, then in the next verse, he tells us how to have the peace of God. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, pre or think about such things. So God's basically telling us if you don't have any peace, it's because you're thinking on wrong things. And that is so true. You don't want any peace in your life? Just start meditating on all the negative things going on in your life and in your world. Remember, your faith is always being contested by this world, by your flesh, and by the devil. And if you meditate on those things, peace is going to go right out the window. But if you'll meditate on the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, if you'll meditate on the hope that he has given you, because he's the source of hope, then he'll pull you through every single storm, every single time. With every eye closed and every head bowed. <clears throat> God is wanting to help some of us today. And to receive the help from God. <clears throat> to receive help from God, it's up to us, not up to him. He's already gone out of his way to help us. He sent Jesus to die for us as a living sacrifice to give himself holy for the church. He's given us this great hope, the king of glory inside of us. He's given us faith, and your faith is powerful. The Bible says if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain about the mountain be removed. You got this great power and this great hope in Jesus.